So I want to begin by giving you an image that I hope will serve as a kind of rubric um, for our conversation. And I could, you know, show you a PowerPoint slide of it, but actually I'm a writer and I'm, I'm going to use language all night tonight, no images. So the images are going to come from your own imagination, so you're going to conjure this up in your mind's eye. So I want to begin by asking you to imagine a tree with a double trunk and, and, and suggest that this is um, a symbol, an icon of our, the environmental crisis, which is in, in, in essence two crises in, in one like a tree with two trunks that share a common root. And, and one trunk of this tree of crisis represents what's happening to our planet through the accumulation of heat trapping gases in the atmosphere. And if you follow this trunk along, you encounter such endpoints as droughts, floods, dissolving coral reef, and this unfortunate fact now that one in every four mammal species is, is headed for extinction. I'm gonna say that again. So right now, we are uh, the adults in a generation of people at a moment in history when one in every four fellow mammal species are vanishing, are going to be gone, probably within our ch own children's lifetimes. Not future generations, we're talking about the kids across the dinner table from us every night. So that's one trunk. The other trunk of the tree of crisis what's, it represents what's happening to us uh, through the chemical adulteration of our own bodies and, and of the environment that we inhabit um, through uh, toxic chemical pollution. And if you follow this trunk of the tree along, you find things like disappearing pollinators, right, um, who are, um, provide us one in every three bites of food that we eat are brought to us by pollination. You find things like um, asthma from ozone um, created when different toxic chemicals mixed together in our atmosphere, ozone, a very powerful cellular poison. You find things like pediatric cancer, falling age or puberty in girls, learning disabilities, and so on. So we have chemical adulteration uh, on one side of the trunk and then the other trunk representing climate disruption. So I, I wanna go back now and kind of describe the climate trunk in a little more detail because this is the, all the headline news today. And in spite of the fact that we're now having a national conversation about climate change, um, there's very, uh, there's a sort of a lack of understanding on the part of the public about what is actually the, the problem. And this came to light recently when a survey was done of 350 perfectly well-educated, intelligent people who were asked to explain what the mechanism of, of climate change is and exactly nobody got, got the answer right. Uh, and I take that as a personal failure on the part of the community that I belong to, which is a, a community of, uh, of science writers, um, and specifically environmental writers. So we have somehow failed to bring the message of, of what the most pressing moral issue of the day is b before the public, to, to bring out of the soundproofed scientific literature and lay it before people in a, a way that they can, that makes sense to them. Um, so because I see myself as an educator first and foremost, let me just begin with some basic science education. By saying that um, climate change um, is brought about a, by a phenomenon um, that happens when the sun um, shines both visible light as well as thermal radiation, or what we call heat, onto the earth. And um, in the absence of our atmosphere, um, every time the earth turned and was no longer facing the sun, we would all freeze to death at night. The fact that that doesn't happen is because the atmosphere contains certain kinds of gases that have the ability to trap heat, and that's a good thing. And, and not all gases are capable of doing that. Uh, I mentioned at the beginning of my introduction that you had been diagnosed with bladder cancer at 20, and maybe for people that haven't read your extraordinary book or seen the film, which you'll have a chance to see on Monday, they're there wondering what happened. So what happened? And do you know now what caused your cancer? Well, no, I mean, I'm a sample size of one, right? So, um, and, and cancer can have multiple causes. Any one tumor can have, um, it takes multiple mutations often to create cancer. So one could, you could have inherited, one could come from your environment, one could come from your cruddy lifestyle and so forth, right? Um, but it, it occurs to me that um, all of us, whether we're adopted or not, 
Um, we can't change our ancestors. I don't happen to know who mine are. Um, but we, we, because we can't change that, and we can change our chemical, our materials economy, our, the chemicals that we allow to be in our environment, it's a meaningful place to begin a program of cancer prevention by, by looking for environmental causes instead of getting involved in arguments about which is more important, genes or in the environment. I mean, we're stuck with the genes, right? So it doesn't even seem important for me to talk, talk about that. Um, but for me, as a 20-year-old, in between my sophomore and junior years, I was diagnosed with bladder cancer. And it was really questions by my own diagnosing physician about what chemicals I was exposed to as a child that led me to start gathering string on this issue. Um, and it also, I made a decision right then and there that I wasn't going on to medical school, which had been the plan. And once you're a patient, I don't think you just don't want a hospital to be your workplace anymore. Um, and so, uh, so that led me into environmental health um, instead. And then it was years later in my mid-30s, um, with the help of a, a, a postdoc from Harvard Radcliffe, um, I went back to my hometown, moved into my sister's basement, and then became a kind of environmental detective there. And I did uncover the presence of bladder carcinogens in my hometown drinking water well. I guess that's a punchline to living downstream that my publicist probably wouldn't want me to reveal, because you're all supposed to um, by the book, but um, I, th I mean, I think it's an interesting book whether you know that or not, right? <laughs> um, and so, you know, do, do I know for sure that, that drinking, growing up drinking the solvent was what caused my bladder cancer? Well, no, um, but I, I do know enough as a biologist to say that kids shouldn't grow up drinking dry cleaning solvents. Um, and so the question about how did they get there um, is, is the part of the story. And, and, and the other question is, what obligation do we have to people who come after us? Because those chemicals were dumped way before I was born, probably 80 years before I was born. And they, and they slowly worked their way like a falling curtain of chemicals into the drinking water. So somebody did that, you know, 80 years ago, and then I'm still paying the price. Because bladder cancer, of all cancers, is the one most likely to recur. So I, for, I'm turning 55 now, so I've been a cancer patient for 35 years. and so. Um, and I'm in and out of the hospital all the time. In fact, I'm waiting for results from the pathology lab now, right? So it never really ends. And so what obligation did that guy who threw chemicals out the back door have to me? Mm -hmm. What obligation do we have to those who come after us? That's something I feel very strongly. Mm -hmm.